Welcome to Building the Future. I'm your host, Kevin Horick. You can check out the radio version of the show every Tuesdays and Thursdays at 2 p.m. Eastern on WDJY 99.1 in Atlanta. We also air on a podcasting network in Los Angeles called the 405 Media. There's a TV version of the show that airs on KMVT 15 in Silicon Valley at 8 p.m. Pacific on Tuesday nights. Both versions of the show air in other states. For these show times plus past episodes, please visit the show's website at buildingthefutureshow.com. The music for the show is done by Electric Mantra. You can check him out at electricmantra.com. Conscious Company Media's World Changing Women's Summit, hosted from February 20th to the 22nd at 1440 Multiversity outside of Santa Cruz, California, is a first-of-its-kind gathering for female professionals who work at or are interested in conscious and sustainable businesses. Top female CEOs, entrepreneurs, executives, investors, and thought leaders from around the world will gather for three days to connect and share wisdom, insights, and best practices for thriving while changing the world for the better through the power of business. If you're interested in joining or know someone who should attend, go to worldchangingwomensummit.com for more information. Welcome back to the show. Today we have Felipe Capella. He's the co-founder and chief product officer at LoadSmart. Felipe, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Kevin. Yeah, I'm excited to have you on the show. I I think what you guys are doing is is actually really cool and innovative. But maybe before we kind of get into LoadSmart, Let's get to know you a little bit better and cover where you grew up. Sure. Uh, so my background is a little bit uh, unusual. Okay. I grew up in Brazil, actually. Uh, went to law school there, uh, practiced law for a few years, uh, doing foreign direct investment, uh, mergers and acquisitions, these kind of things. Okay. So, so- uh, moved to Madrid for a master's, then moved to Philadelphia for an Sorry. No, I was going to say, what made you kind of get into law, just out of curiosity? Well, uh, in Brazil, you have to make this kind of decisions very early in life. Uh, we do not have the concept of college sure. that you guys have over here. So you have to make the decisions when you're 17 or 18. Uh, uh, and uh, I think, I guess, when you're 17 and 18 years old, uh, law school sounds like a, a, an exciting path. Sure. Okay, so you... you... You went to school kind of all over. Why did you decide to kind of go all over the world and take different uh, schooling? Well, after I graduated, that was back in 2002. So I practiced in in Brazil for around seven years. And uh, I actually moved to Madrid because I had an opportunity. I got a scholarship from the Spanish government. It's something that I, I could not say no. Yeah, everything was paid for, so uh, I just got along with it. And living in a foreign country is all uh, uh, was something that I always uh, dreamed of. So that's why I moved to Madrid in the first place. Uh, and then I moved to Philadelphia for my second master's because I, I always had also this dream of coming to the United States and, and attending one of the, the, the top world schools. Uh, so that's why I did this like kind of like two masters in a row. And after I left uh, Philly, I got a, a, a job offer in New York. So I practiced law here for, for a couple of years, uh, mostly mergers and acquisitions. Okay. Moved to Washington, D.C. Uh, to work on the Inter-American Development Bank, uh, doing international loans to Latin American countries for development projects like building hospitals, bridges, roads. Uh, so I got a really good understanding of public policy and development investments, which is something that I really, really like. And after a decade, decade or so in the corporate world, uh, I felt that I had to do something else, uh, try something new. Uh, and first, uh, I thought that making this move from law to the startup world would be too tough, uh, given my background. But uh, examples as, for example, Peter Thiel from PayPal and uh, Joe Tsai, the co-founder of Alibaba, both uh, with very similar backgrounds, is actually coming from the same firm that I work oh, wow. at, uh, for in New York City. So yeah, Sullivan and Cromwell. Uh, uh, made me more comfortable in making this, this jump. Uh, so I left uh, uh, the bank to start my own thing. And meanwhile, a, a very close friend of mine, Ricardo, uh, uh, after spending many years at Goldman Sachs investing in logistics, was going through a similar uh, exercise. And after we talked, discussed, uh, we were on the phone all the time, uh, and he was telling me about his idea, I realized that actually his idea was much better than mine. 
<laughs> and I decided to join his effort. But he gets all the kudos for picking the transportation vertical and uh, <laughs> and, and uh, starting loads market. <laughs> no, that's great, man. I I I think that having a, a legal background um, is very beneficial in a startup, right? Like I think the two things that are probably the most related are kind of legal and accounting, right? And and so I think in some cases you have an advantage um, just understanding the law. At least have you found that? Yeah, 100%. And, and when you start a, a, a new company uh, uh, out of nothing, right? And you understand that you have to have like a, the, the, the breath, like you have to understand a little bit of, of uh, the legal part, a little bit of uh, operations, a little bit of marketing, a little bit of business uh, uh, in general, right? And as I did a lot of, uh, again, mergers and acquisitions, uh, uh, and I got to know uh, uh, the corporate world inside out, I think that played a, a, a huge it's a beneficial part in starting a new company. Sure. No, I 100% agree. So what made you guys decide to found LoadSmart? Was there kind of like a defining moment or your, your co-founder was like, a, there's a hole in the industry or like, how did it come to be? So oh, that's a, that's a very good question. And uh, again, I give uh, a, a kudos to, to Ricardo. So after 13 years at uh, Goldman Sachs, okay. uh, he worked like in New York and Brazil, London, and also he invested a lot in, in logistics companies uh, uh, on behalf of Goldman Sachs. So after 13 years, he decided to go back to his, to his engineering roots. Uh, he's actually, uh, uh, he went to engineering school. Uh, and then he's, he's a very pragmatic uh, uh, guy. So he analyzed a bunch of different industries uh, from healthcare to banking uh, to, to, to logistics. Okay. And then uh, he realized that logistics, uh, a specific like uh, the, the freight brokerage that we can talk about in a second, uh, had a lot of interesting aspects. Uh, for example, I think the three that, that, that I, I could summarize is first fragmentation. Uh, the leader in the freight brokerage market has 2.2% of the market share. Okay. Uh, so it's very, very, very fragmented. Uh, on the, also on the demand and the supply side, uh, uh, so we have more than 3.5 million trucks in the U.S. and they're uh, uh, divided amongst more than 250,000 transportation companies. Uh, on the shipper side, there are hundreds of thousands of shippers. So there's a huge fragmentation uh, in the industry. The second one would be the, the, the size. Uh, trucking in the U.S. is a $700 billion industry. Wow. It's a really uh, a huge number. Only the truckload. So truckload is when you move whole containers. So it's a little bit different from what you see uh, UPS and FedEx doing that they move like parcels and sure. boxes, right? Uh, the truckload is just a whole uh, uh, trailer. It's more like B2B uh, uh, thing. It's a $300 billion industry. So it's really huge. So the size of the industry clearly played a, a, a part on that. And third, the lack of technology. Right. So even back in 2014, when we started the company, uh, we had to buy a fax machine because wow. we got so many calls of these truck drivers and the transportation companies asking us, no, we want to send you a fax. And we're saying, no, just send me an email, PDF. No, 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 <laughs> we, we need to send you a fax. That's how we build things. Uh, so we, we understood uh, how... Uh, like this lack of technology and how this, this industry was a little bit, uh, uh, they were doing the same things that they had been doing in the 80s and 90s. So this was also like a huge opportunity that we saw in this industry. Interesting. So walk me through, you kind of covered it quickly, but like walk me through exactly what LoadSmart does and kind of how it's different and how you're going from kind of the old way of doing things to kind of the new modern way of doing things. Oh, that's great. Uh, so, uh, Kevin, imagine a big supermarket chain, okay. right? Uh, they, buy they buy hundreds of thousands of pounds of products every week sure. from farmers, uh, beverage industry, etc. And they have to send all these products uh, from one place to the other, right? They have to send it from the, their farms to distribution centers, from distribution centers to the stores. And for that, they need trucks, like hundreds of trucks per day. But how do they find the right truck to move every single one of these loads? And I'm talking about hundreds uh, per day. Sure. So usually uh, they rely on freight brokers. Uh, freight brokers are in the business of finding new trucks. 
Okay. Um, but but historically, uh, freight brokers rely uh, a lot on human beings. Uh, so there are more than 3.5 million trucks in the U.S. and they are divided uh, amongst 250,000 transportation companies. So if you're a freight broker and you need to find a truck for your client, uh, you have 250,000 options oh, of wow. companies to call, right? Uh, and these companies, again, they're very fragmented. Uh, 90% uh, of all these transportation companies have less than 10 trucks each. Oh, wow. Uh, so how do you find the right truck? How do you find the right company? Uh, and again, usually you, they rely a lot on human beings, uh, calling, uh, the whole day, the transportation companies asking for quotes, asking if they have a truck available. Uh, and then after a while, like a few hours, they go back to the supermarket chain, which is the shipper in this case and tell them, okay, I, I found you a truck after three hours. I called 120 uh, companies and there's someone that has a truck available 120 miles from, from, your, from your pickup location. And we thought this was extremely inefficient, sure. right? And, uh, and there's no way you also you can call 250,000 companies. No. Uh, uh, so at the end of the day, you may not uh, uh, even like find the right truck. It's just find a, a truck. But again, like maybe this truck is really far away from where you are. So you have to pay for this, what we call dead hat, which is a truck moving empty. Uh, which is very inefficient for everyone involved. So what we are trying to do is to use an incredible amount of data to find the best truck without having to rely on phone calls and emails. Interesting. Uh, so we have set up a machine learning process that identifies the best truck among 3 million of them, 3.5 million of them, to move a specific cargo at a given point in time. Uh, so whenever you hop on in our website, you just have to give us two zip codes and I can show you a price immediately. Uh, again, you know, in, in the regular industry, these, uh, the freight brokers call the transportation companies to get quotes. I don't call anyone. I use data to tell me what will be my cost on finding a truck for that specific load at that specific time in the future for a specific pair of cities, pick up and delivery cities. So again, I rely on data. Uh, 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 so that allows us to provide to shippers an instant experience. So they just put, again, two zip codes, uh, see a price, and whenever they press book, it means that a 53-foot-long trailer uh, uh, with a, a huge truck is going to show up at your warehouse uh, on the desired day, uh, at the desired time, uh, to move 40,000 pounds of, uh, I don't know, watermelon from California to New York. Sure. Uh, uh, so... You can book a truck in five seconds uh, uh, in our website. Um, but as, that also allows me to provide an instant, instant experience to the other side, to trucking companies. So whenever I identify or whenever my system identifies the right truck to move a load, I just send them an electronic request online. They see it in a web page or in an app. They click a button and they have the load. So not only I try to make it an instant experience for the shipper, but I also try to make an instant experience for the, for the transportation company. So we're kind of a, a, a data company. We rely a lot, on, a lot on data. And I can give you just a quick example, uh, Kevin, of how interesting this thing is. Uh, just one small data point that we take into account. For example, we parse all the national uh, and state uh, roadside inspection reports. Oh, interesting. So in the U.S., sometimes tr trucks are stopped by, by, by authorities. To, to, to be inspected, and we get all these reports, we parse them to, look, to, to build a heat map of where all these trucks have been uh, in the past year or years, right? So for example, if I, if I know that this truck was inspected in the north of Maine six times in the past 12 months, I know this truck goes to the north of Maine very often. So if I have a load that touches the north of Maine, I should take this truck and this transportation company into account. And this is only one small data point of hundreds sure. that we take into account to know where all trucks were, where they are, and whether where they, there will be in the future. So a lot of times uh, when we call or when we email or we send electronic requests to transportation companies, they are a little bit uh, puzzled. They say like, but how do you know uh, that my, I have a truck available to move your load? So a lot of times we know better the trucking company than they know themselves. Interesting. So. 
So how does it kind of work? And may, this might be a stupid question, but like, do I need to rent out the whole truck? Can I just say I have one pallet that I need to go from California to New York in the next like week or two? And you guys do that? Or do I need to rent the whole truck? This is, this is a good question. So when I was talking before about truckload, and that's what I meant. So we only work right now with full truckloads. We okay. need the whole trailer. Sure. Right? Because we want to do one thing. And we want to be the best of it. Sure. Uh, and then we can move on to different things like LPL, which is less than truckload, which is exactly what you mentioned, uh, are like pallets and, and, and boxes and this kind of thing. Gotcha. But right now we're very focused on, on truckload, which is more like a B2B uh, 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 relationship. So again, the supermarket chains, uh, beverage industries that sure. they move things from uh, factories to distrib distribution centers and this kind of stuff. Sure. And you... You guys also do kind of real-time tracking. Is that correct? Yes, 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 it is. And this is, a, this is something that's very challenging uh, for, the, for the industry. Sure. And uh, knowing where the truck is uh, uh, all times helps a lot on controlling for on-time pickup and on-time delivery. Sure. Uh, on-time delivery is very, very important nowadays because as companies work with this uh, just-in-time uh, logistics management, uh, style is very important for trucks to be on time when, when, when they get to specific warehouse. Also because we see a lot of, uh, and as we go forward, more and more companies work with appointments. So it means that if a truck picks up something in uh, Los Angeles and delivers in Miami, I have a specific hour of a specific day that this truck has to arrive at this warehouse in Miami. Right. It means like four days later, you know, it's not that easy to control <laughs> Uh, uh, for this kind of thing. So if you have uh, uh, real-time tracking and know where the truck is all times, you can control a little bit better. Sure. And if something happens, you can uh, uh, reroute the truck to a different warehouse or you can uh, address a specific concern. Uh, if the truck is delayed, maybe you can uh, uh, be, be a little bit proactive and change the appointment time, the delivery location. Uh, also, you can, have, you can keep the, the shipper inform at all times where their load uh, uh, is, which is uh, very important as well. Sure, because we've all been to like some store where they're out of something, whether it's clothing or food or whatever, and they're like, well, the earliest we'll get it is like next Tuesday, but it could be as late as Friday, right? We've all been there. And so being able to just know like, no, it, it, the shipment's coming at 4 p.m. on Tuesday, and it'll be out on the floor by the following morning or, or later that night is huge, right? And actually quite groundbreaking in, in the industry. Is that fair to say? Yeah, yeah, it is. I think the whole, to be, to be honest, I think the whole industry is trying to work towards more visibility. Okay. Uh, uh, and I think that's good for everyone involved. And we are one of the companies trying to push for it, uh, trying to have more visibility uh, on where all trucks are. Uh, all the time. So, uh, because we do believe that this is good for everyone involved. It's not only good for the shipper, it's good for the warehouse as well. It's good for, for, for the buyer. It's good for the trucking company. It's good for the freight brokerage. Uh, uh, so it's, it's, it's a win-win situation for everyone. No, I, I think that's really cool. So I'm curious though, how do you kind of see the future of this industry? Like, like I know Tesla just released or, or they're working on work releasing like a, a driverless kind of Tesla, you know, truck and other companies are kind of working on this. Like, where do you kind of see the industry of kind of trucking and on demand kind of shipping going? This is a, this is a great question, uh, Kevin. Uh, yeah, Tesla just released their, their electric uh, semi truck. It was, it was pretty, uh, pretty interesting. And uh, as always, they do a really good job on, on, on PR and, uh, and marketing. Um, well, for the short term, I do believe that, uh, uh, and we already see that, a lot of technology uh, kind of inundating the, the, the logistics market with hundreds of uh, very clever solutions to, to automate logistics, uh, not, only, uh, not only on the trucking side, to be honest, or not, not only on uh, freight brokerage, but... Uh, but ocean, air, everything that touches logistics nowadays is very hot uh, because I think uh, everyone realized first the size of the industry, which is huge, and second, the kind of lack of technology that logistics was kind of like left behind in the technology uh, uh, revolution. 
So I think uh, we already see a, a lot of different companies uh, 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 showing up and having different solutions, which I think benefits everyone. Uh, companies are also moving from EDIs, uh, uh, electronic data interchange, to APIs. And this is also very interesting because uh, when you take a look at other industries, everyone only works with APIs and, and logistics industry is the one, again, that still relies a lot on this more ancient uh, uh, data transmission method. So we see uh, also this transition to more automated and more efficient methods of data transmission. Um, I do also believe that operational costs of moving the loads uh, by themselves are going to decrease as we see data, the data sharing, again, more visibility as we're talking, we see automation. Uh, whenever we have GPS tracking uh, with, uh, in all the trucks, we can also automate a lot of different bureaucratic processes that you have. Uh, whenever the driver arrives at the warehouse, it has to do some bureaucratic processes, send some papers. So these things are all moving uh, 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 online to, to electronic processes. So we, I, we do believe also the costs are coming down. Okay. On the medium term, uh, uh, I would say, specifically on the freight brokerage industry, which kind of intermediates between uh, shippers and transportation companies, uh, I do believe there's going to be a huge consolidation uh, on the uh, freight brokerage uh, side. As I mentioned before, the, the largest uh, freight broker has 2.2 percent of the of the market uh, share, which is very small, sure. even though they're worth 11.2 billion dollars which tells you something about the, the size of the industry. Wow. But we do believe there's a huge space for consolidation in the, in, in the medium term. And we kind of already are starting to see that uh, uh, a little bit. Uh, we see, we're going to see, again, in the medium term, a lot of public testing of uh, several semi, semi and fully autonomous trucks. Uh, you mentioned Tesla. They have their semi truck, electrical semi truck. But you have all the, the, the OEMs. Uh, like uh, Daimler, Mercedes, like Volvo, like Packard, uh, all these guys are investing heavily on uh, autonomous trucks. And, and remember, in theory, uh, autonomous trucks, we should see autonomous trucks uh, uh, before uh, autonomous uh, vehicles actually in cities because sure. having autonomous vehicles inside cities is much more complex, uh, like 10x or more complex than having a truck just moving along the highway. Sure. Like, so imagine like a kind of a hub to hub or warehouse to warehouse in which the trucks only have to drive through a highway. Yeah, so they fair. do not have like a kids playing in the street. They do not have like a cars parked in like double lanes uh, uh, and other kinds of weird things that we see inside uh, inside cities. Uh, so we do. I do think we're gonna see uh, uh, autonomous trucks earlier than uh, than people actually uh, believe. Um, I think, and I think in the longer term, uh, we're going to see, again, a lot of different states in the United States clearing autonomous trucks for specific lanes, hub to hub, uh, costs are going to drop significantly. Um, I, then we're going to see also a huge consolidation of, on the transportation side, because as I mentioned, on the trucking side, as I mentioned, there are more than 250,000 companies, 90% of them with uh, less than 10 trucks. Uh, so again, there's a huge space for consolidation also on the trucking side, but I, I, I do think this is going to ha happen more in the longer, in the longer term. And I, I do think the, the manufacturers, again, uh, OEMs, are still uh, uh, waiting to see what's happening, but uh, uh, they're going to play a huge role on what's happening, uh, what's going to happen in the future. No, I, I think that's quite fascinating. And you also allow people, like uh, carriers, to actually come on the LoadSmart platform Walk us through how that kind of works. Like, do I need, if I have one truck, can I join Load, uh, Load Smart, or do I need to have like a few trucks? Or how does that kind of work if I'm a carrier and I want to say, you know, I have trucks available to, you know, take loads across the country? No, absolutely. No, if you have one truck or if you have uh, 5,000 trucks, actually, you have both examples uh, in our platform. Okay. Uh, uh, you're uh, more than welcome to join LoadSmart. Again, we run a, a very complex data model and machine learning processes to try to predict uh, where your truck is going to be available, if, in, either if you, are, if you have signed up for LoadSmart or not. Okay, uh, right? We have a lot of 
public, publicly available data, and as I mentioned before, for example, inspection data, uh, no one gives us that. This is public information that we analyze. So whenever you join those markets, you have a pretty good idea of where you operate, uh, where your truck has been in the past. But as you provide us with more information, we can do a better job of sending you the right loads. Uh, and we're really proud of ourselves of sen sending targeted loads to our uh, uh, carrier uh, customers. So whenever a, a, a truck delivers something, let's say in, 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 in New York uh, at 1 p.m. today, I, and they want to go back to Miami, let's say where their, where their uh, headquarters is, sure. uh, we want to send a specific load from New York to Miami for your carrier. So your, carrier, your truck does not have to drive south empty for a long period of time. So the more information we have, the better. So everyone is welcome to, to, to sign up uh, with LoadSmart. Uh, tell us whatever information you have on your, uh, on your carrier or on your operations. Uh, you can even tell us where your truck is actually going to be available at uh, uh, to, to be 100% certain that we have the, the right data. Uh, and we're going to send you the targeted loads for you to, to keep your trucks full. No, I, I think that's actually really interesting and kind of a good segue from kind of the future stuff because as you collect more data and more data becomes kind of available, you can only do cooler things with it, right? And you, like you said, you have all this open source kind of data, plus you know where I'm going to be and how long I'm going to get there and you could start, you know, almost planning my weeks or months or potentially years in the future because of all this data you have, right? You're like, okay, I'm going from Miami to New York. He's got a shipment and then he's going from New York back to Miami or like there's a handful of ways. And then once he's back in Miami, he might go to like say Austin and then back from like you can do all this crazy stuff with data that that's only going to get better over time. Fair to say? You, exactly. That's exactly what we're trying to do. And as, as we get better on doing that, and I, as I aggregate more demand on the shipper side and more supply from the, the, the carrier side, I become really the true platform in which uh, shippers uh, join to, to, to book trucks and carriers join to have their, their trucks uh, full all the time. But exactly as I mentioned, our dream is to keep uh, our uh, uh, carrier's trucks uh, full uh, and without having to drive any additional mile empty. Uh, and, and that we rely uh, mostly on data and, uh, and, uh, and complex machine learning processes to do that. No, that's, that's very cool. So I, I'm curious to dive into kind of the startup side of the business a little bit here. Um, obviously, you guys have a, a web presence where people can kind of get an instant quote online that you have like a, a portal where they log in or, or can sign up to and you have kind of apps on Android and iOS. But walk us through kind of what different kind of things actually can be done in, in kind of the website and, and on the app side of things. Okay, that, that's, that's, that's a great question. So on the shipper side, the main uh, service that we provide is this ability of shippers to uh, uh, book, to see a price instantly and this is not like an estimated price. This is actual price that we're going to commit to. Okay. Whenever you, you hop online on the web, for example, as you mentioned, you just uh, give us two zip codes. I'm going to provide an executable price instantly that you can just uh, uh, press book. And again, a, a truck is going to show up at the desired date and time. Uh, interestingly enough, to, to address your question, uh, this, the, our web platform for shippers it's more targeted to small and mid mid sized companies. Okay. Because again, if you move one or two loads per day, you don't mind including like two zip codes, uh, uh, seeing a price, and then booking, and then you provide a little bit more information after you book. Uh, but whenever you're a big, for example, supermarket chain, and you move 500 loads per day and need 500 trucks, you're not going to be inputting a, a thousand zip codes and giving us information about a thousand different. Uh, uh, locations. So what we do in this case is that we integrate with your software. So whenever you, uh, your uh, logistics uh, uh, professional uh, wakes up in the morning, gets to work, and they look at their internal system with all these 500 loads that they have to move, our price is already there for every single of these loads without you having to do anything. Oh, very cool. uh, so this is a service that we provide. 
Yeah, this is a service that we provide for enterprise, what we call enterprise shippers. So shippers that move uh, a, a large number of uh, shipments per day. So they don't have to do basically anything. <laughs> we just provide uh, instant pricing uh, for all their loads daily uh, automatically. Uh, so I think that this is a pretty interesting thing on the shipper side. Uh, on the carrier side, on the transportation company side, uh, it's, a, it's a similar story. So we can hop on uh, uh, online and you're going to see the loads that we think better match your profile or better match where we believe your trucks are and they will be. So we have a, like a recommended loads. Uh, you see the price of the load there. So there's no, uh, 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 so all the loads that you see actually exist because remember, once the shipper books with us, now we have the load. So whenever we expose this load to our carrier partners, they know that this load exists and they just have to press accept to get this load. So it's just a one click experience on the carrier side. Uh, and also on the, on the app, we provide a, a, what we call the, our instant loads app. Also, if, if you're too busy to get uh, on, on the web uh, portal, you just check your mobile app and you're going to see the loads that better match your, your profile. So it's as easy as clicking uh, one button. No, I, I think that's actually really fascinating. The, the thing that I, and I'm, I'm really curious about this, and I don't know if you guys are ever going to do this or not, but how much from the carrier side, if I own a truck or a fleet of trucks, and I use, you know, LoadSmart kind of all the time, daily basis, it's connected to my, my software, and I it just kind of runs itself. Do you actually pull in or think about pulling in data from the truck in the sense that, you know, potentially say I buy a truck today so it's brand new and i'm you know i use you guys to ship all the time or and um my truck goes from i don't know la to new york and all over all over the country do you guys do anything like predictive kind of maintenance where you could say you know kevin your truck needs to be the oil needs to change change because you you know you're at your your miles or you know your truck's been going up and down a bunch of hills you know you need to maybe look at this or or like you know your tires are probably worn out do, do you do any of that or eventually maybe get into that space because i think that could be really cool Dude, this is a great question kevin and uh we discussed that a lot again like back in 2014 when we were trying to to come up uh, uh, with uh, what products we should develop uh, to, to address the pain points of the industry. And this is something that we, we talked and, and thought about. Uh, uh, should we address the need, for example, to build a, a fleet management uh, service or product uh, to allow uh, small carriers uh, uh, to manage their own, uh, their own business? Uh, back in 2014, around only 18% of all transportation companies have relied on the uh, fleet management software. So it means that uh, the vast majority of the transportation companies did not have anything in place. Right? And we actually built a small, uh, a simple fleet management solution for small, for small carriers. Uh, uh, we realized, and, and, and then maybe we can, we can talk a little bit about the startup world, is that once you you really have to be focused as sure. a startup, right? Uh, and we realized that the, the fleet management, although it was really cool, as you mentioned, adds a ton of value, uh, we could not try to do 10 different things at the same time. Sure. So we decided that we would stop at our basic version of uh, our fleet management just as a free service to our uh, small carriers uh, we would not go on to compete with the more complete solutions uh, on the fleet management side. So if you're a, a transportation company and you have 100 trucks, uh, 500 trucks, you, you have your own needs, uh, you have your own complex uh, product demands that, that you have. And we, we decided not to go that way and focus on exactly what the problems that we're trying to solve, which are actually providing this immediate experience to the shipper to book a truck sure. and for, for the carriers to provide targeted loads that they can, they can accept with one click. Uh, in, a, in the startup world, you're very tempted all the time, actually. That's not only the beginning. We still face this vision right now. We're always tempted to come up with new business ideas, new products, 
uh, and something that's very difficult to focus. Sure. Right. Uh, 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 and this is something that, again, it's not only uh, at the beginning of the COVID, but that's true today. Uh, so it's like it sort of kind of a focus trap. Uh, uh, so we, we try every week to remind ourselves of what the problems we're trying to fix, what, what, what are the worst pain points that we're trying to address and not get a little bit distracted uh, by trying, trying to build a different product for a different uh, problem. No, I, I think that's actually really good advice. And I, I kind of figured that you'd actually say that. And I think it makes a lot of sense. And it's actually really good advice that because there's a totally a market that you guys could go in, but that's not what you guys are kind of focused on. And and so I, I kind of curious, though, how did you guys kind of get version one of this thing kind of up and running? Did you self fund? Did you raise some money? Did you build it yourself? How did you guys kind of actually get version one? out and live and, and people could start using this. So again, we kickstarted the company back in July, 2014. Uh, we self-funded for a few months, uh, um, trying, uh, doing a lot of research in the market, trying some uh, designing mock-ups, going to, 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 to the industry, showing them and iterating. Actually the first idea, because we saw that, that the huge problem was this uh, lack of transparency on, on the shipper side and how, long they were taking to execute a spot shipment uh, and the, the, the fact that they didn't have like a firm price. So we thought, like, okay, so whenever we have a request from a shipper, we're going to go electronically uh, to, to motor carriers, to transportation companies. We're going to ask them for price, for quotes, and then we're going to immediately return to the shipper with these quotes. And uh, after a few weeks, we realized this, this is not doable, right? Okay. Because uh, again, there are 250,000 companies no one is like sitting uh, 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 in a desk just waiting for you to send to, to reply a request immediately. We could not uh, keep the shippers waiting for minutes on the web portal uh, to get back a quote. And that's when we advanced from this this initial idea of collecting electronically quotes from actually providing the quote ourselves based on data. Right. So it was actually like a, a market research. So this was an evolved idea. Uh, um, and then it took us like a few months to come up with the, the, the final uh, uh, product uh, uh, um, structure. And then uh, at the end of 2014, we raised uh, $3 million. Wow. Uh, and then uh, we, yeah, we raised uh, our kind of Series A, uh, $10 million uh, as well. So, so far we raised $13.5 million. Wow, that's great. Uh, but again, it, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's uh, your ideas evolve, right? You come up with a basic idea based on an industry analysis. Then whenever you start testing out the basic uh, idea, you realize the mistakes that you have made. Uh, you have your kind of evolved idea, which in our case was this machine learning uh, instant pricing experience. Uh, but I think the most important of everything is the iteration, right? Yeah. Uh, what we have been doing for the past uh, two years. Uh, uh, so you have, to learn, you have to build a product, Go out there in the market, test it out, learn with your customers, uh, learn with your uh, uh, users, uh, iterate and, and get better. Uh, uh, and I think sometimes people expect that they will go out there with a killer product or a killer feature and they, they, they underestimate the need for uh, uh, multiple uh, uh, iterations of the product. And that's, that's just normal. No, I, I think that's, that's really good advice. So I'm curious though, how did you guys go about getting kind of your first customers? You kind of mentioned you were asking people in the industry, but what was your kind of successful um, first few customers? How did you guys kind of land them? Did you meet them at events? Did you go to trade shows? Did you cold call a little bit of email? How, how did you guys kind of land your first few customers? Well, I think at the beginning it was a mix of everything that you mentioned, right? Okay. So we started to attend some trade shows. Uh, uh, we had like some uh, regular uh, cold calls. Uh, and that was when we were trying to iterate and test our product a little bit better. Uh, after we launched our instant pricing, instant booking uh, in September 2015, which was the first uh, uh, kind of uh, service of, of this kind that you, that, that you signed uh, in the United States, then we actually it was, we got a lot of uh, cold calls from shippers, which was very interesting. Uh, actually, two of our biggest clients nowadays 
uh, our clients have called us. Uh, uh, so they, it was good because the cost of acquisition was zero that we can really brag about. Sure. But, uh, but I, I think once, once you have something that addresses uh, a huge pain point of the industry, it's much easier to, to go out there and get customers because it has something new that no one is doing. Uh, and I think uh, shippers uh, and the whole industry, actually, logistics, logistics nowadays, is very interested in new technology. Uh, so everyone is very curious to see, to see what you're doing. And that's why it's not only us. Uh, you have a lot of, of uh, new startups in the industry. And, and I think uh, we're getting a lot of visibility uh, because people realize that logistics were a little bit, was a little bit like left behind and they're trying to catch up. Sure. So do you guys have a, a team of, of kind of developers on staff or how does that kind of work to actually get the product kind of, you know, you mentioned iterate um, as you're adding new features and kind of changing them stuff and onboarding kind of enterprise customers. Do you guys have a full team on staff or do you kind of outsource some of that stuff or how does that kind of work? Yeah. So no, uh, this uh, we're really proud uh, of uh, our current team structure. Uh, there are a lot of different uh, startups that are trying to to uh, improve the the industry with technology, and I think uh, everyone adds a lot and uh, helps build uh, efficiency. But something that we're proud of ourselves of is that we really focus on technology. Okay. Uh, so our team currently is around like forty people, oh, wow. and half of them. Uh, it's composed of uh, 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 software engineers and data scientists. Okay. So half of our team, around 20 people, it's, are only dedicated to build technology. Uh, these, these are all like in-house. Uh, we, we do not outsource anything because uh, this is too complex. And also because we want our tech team to be really side-by-side -side with our operations team and sales team in order to understand the pain point of the client, right? Sure. To feel uh, uh, why... A certain product is so important for a specific shipper uh, to feel. Also, we, we build a lot of technology for our operations team. Uh, so we want to be super efficient. Uh, so we are building automation and efficiency. And when we're doing that, we rely a lot on, on our internal operations team to tell us what to build. Like we want each one of our operation uh, sourcing guys to, to, uh, uh, to be able to handle dozens and dozens of uh, loads uh, uh, per hour. Uh, so uh, we do have, a, a, to answer your question more directly, we do have a, a, a big tech team, it's, which is like half of our company, in-house. Uh, most of them have around 10 years of uh, software development experience. So these are our senior guys sure. uh, building uh, uh, our technology. And, and we, are, we consider ourselves a, 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 a data technology company first and foremost, uh, but with a huge uh, uh, operational inside from the freight uh, brokerage. No, I, I think that's really great. And, and your main office is in New York, correct? That's correct. Our main office uh, is in New York City. Uh, we have uh, an office in Brazil uh, as well. Sure. Uh, not <laughs> coincidentally, uh, I'm from Brazil. Sure. So we have an office over there. Um, uh, yeah, and, and it's very interesting. So also we rely on uh, people uh, in other parts of the world, world as well, which is uh, a challenge, but also a benefit because people come with different sure. cultural backgrounds. Uh, they have different points of view. Uh, our team is as diverse uh, as it could be. We have 70% of our uh, people are bilingual. Very cool. uh, they're like Brazilians, Chinese, Guatemalans, uh, Russian Americans, uh, People from uh, Louisiana. <laughs> <laughs> sure, sure. So no, it's that's a, great. A diverse, it's very diverse as we do, yeah. Yeah, but that's good. And to your point, I, I think it makes a lot of sense, right? Like when you're doing a startup, especially like something that could be operating anywhere on, on the planet, you need that the different perspectives from different cultures and backgrounds. And I, I think that makes it for a better startup. But, but I'm curious to know, you, you have people kind of all over the world, or at least in two major hubs in the world, how do you guys kind of manage just communication between the teams? And is there kind of any tips and advice that you could give to people listening on how to kind of communicate effectively, you know, when people are located in different geographical regions? That's a, that's a great question. And we, we still try 
to work on that every day. Okay. But I think the most important thing is to make everyone feel that they're part of the same team. Sure. So uh, these are not different teams. We do, we, we're not saying like, oh, we, ha we have a team in Brazil and a team in New York. No, everyone is part of the same team, the same company. We're trying to, to, to fight to, to, to fix the same issues. So I think the most important thing, aside from obvious technical things of having, uh, uh, I don't know, daily uh, conference calls, uh, of having like a good, uh, good technology to have a video call, these kind of things, I think the most important thing is to make everyone, independently of where they are located, to feel that they're part of the team. Sure. And that's why also we bring, uh, we bring uh, most of our people uh, that are, for example, located in Brazil, we bring them to New York three or four times a year Very because cool. we like to, to mix everyone up. We, we like these guys to exchange experiences with, uh, with each other. We like them also to get in touch with our operations and sales team, sure. which is located in New York. So we do believe that being uh, uh, frequently under the same roof is also very important to exchange experiences. But again, uh, if I had to give uh, only one answer would be that we try our best to feel, for everyone to feel that they are part of one team with the same, uh, trying to fix the same issues and uh, uh, building the same uh, product. No, I, I think that's really good advice. But sadly, we're coming to the end of the show. So let's close with mentioning where people can get more information about yourself and LoadSmart. Yeah, I think that the easiest way is just to access LoadSmart.com. Uh, if you're a shipper, you can see everything that we're doing there. You can actually try out our instant pricing without even signing up. Uh, it's a public pricing tool. Uh, if you're a carrier, uh, you access loadsmart.com uh, slash carrier, and then you're going to see also all the services that we provide to our uh, carrier partners. Perfect. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time and your day to be on the show, and I look forward to keeping in touch with you, and have a good rest of your day. Awesome, Kevin. Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll talk soon. Okay, bye. Bye. Thanks for listening. Please visit the show's website at buildingthefutureshow.com. Also check us out on Facebook at Building the Future Show and follow us on Twitter at Building Show. The music for the show is done by Electric Mantra. You can check him out at electricmantra.com and keep building the future.